Okay, welcome guys. We're here with Sean and Jeff. Uh, we decided to put together a quick just chat about some interesting agile topics. Um, today we want to talk a little bit about uh, the need for a uh, new way of thinking. So it's it's looking at history and how things have changed, that we've changed the way that we organize ourselves. Agile success limitations and roadblocks. We've all heard about agile transformations. They don't all go really well. Um, why is that? And also, like, what's next? How do we organize for the future? So welcome, Sean, Jeff. Um, very excited. Hey, hey, Nico. Hey, guys. How you guys doing? Awesome. So, Jeff, take it away. All right. So uh, let's talk. Let's give a little bit of a history lesson on why we're organized the way we are most of the time in big enterprises. Um, I like to call it the not so new normal because everyone's talking about this new normal like life has changed upside down. But uh, in reality, um, uh, the forces that have been impacting us, uh, you know, forces of change and uncertainty and complexity have been really around for the last 50, 60 years. And uh, it's now, you know, we, and we're, we, we haven't adapted, at least organizationally. Um, so we're kind of like frogs in the boiling water. Um, you know, the water uh, is getting hotter and hotter and the, the frog just kind of stays there and doesn't really react. Well, now the water's boiling and even the frog can feel it. So I think uh, it's time to do something. So uh, I like to think all of us here at Agile by Design are kind of like um, information radiators for the, for the boiling water. And so that's what I'm going to try to do here. I don't know, guys, you, know, you got anything to that? It's, it's interesting, Jeff, because uh, you're bringing up this idea that, that, that this is not, everybody talks about this being kind of a new normal and and that, you know, COVID has been this big uh, amplifier. I think of it more as an amplifier to change. Yeah, uh, exactly. That, that the impetus for change was always there. It's just, you know, every so often there are these these things that happen that, that greatly accelerate the rate of change. And I think that's kind of what we're experiencing right now. And, and I think, you know, to your point, this has been happening all along. The water's been heating up and, you know, we were the frogs, so to speak. But, uh, but now we're feeling that the temperature's pretty hot. And, and, and that's just because, you know, what, like somebody just turned the boiler up or well, in this case, nature turned the boiler up a little bit on us. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, I like to think of it as like almost singularities, different things in history that really trigger those massive changes. And we can see that now with like the world pandemic, once again, like how all these things are accelerating quite a bit. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, go on, why don't we hit the previous slide? I just want to talk about this super quickly. Um, uh, I love this slide because it really, you know, kind of shows you the market conditions, um, you know, back in the early 1900s. I, I would say that's, you know, another era of profound change that at least looks as rapid as it is right now. Um, you know, we went from kind of lots of craftspeople giving goods to individuals to all of a sudden we had this technology that we could apply at scale. Um, uh, you know, and really, we're you know the, the idea here is we're trying to get the wealth up. You know, we're trying to get people that are relatively poor, relatively uneducated, don't have a lot of material goods, and we're trying to pump out the same thing over and over again to get it to as many people as we possibly can. And, and you know, everyone knows this called what it's called, but I mean, why don't you guys weigh in? What's like, what's your thoughts about this stuff? Well, it's we see the so this thing. This whole this whole paradigm was obviously everybody knows has, has been immensely successful in in ballooning uh, wealth at lower levels than historically we had kind of ever had before, right? They, for for the most part, many 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 people were better off as a result of kind of this paradigm of lowest cost uh, to produce a given good, and that was kind of like a guaranteed recipe for success, right? If you if you lowered the cost and you increase the volume, I mean it's basic math, right? It's the most it's the simplest form of economic yeah. growth is lower the cost many 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 of these things but the problem is 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 and this reminds me a lot of any time that you optimize for one particular metric you get exactly what that metric is trying to drive which is like almost so to speak limitless growth in a single dimension but the problem is that always has to come at a cost to something else and i think like now especially we're starting to feel you know we'll talk about this a little more later but but we're starting to feel the costs of this singular focus on a singular metric of you know economic growth at all costs, uh, and I think that's starting to weigh on people a little more uh, day to day. Yeah, I mean it's funny how the the um, most organizations I go to, uh, not most, I should say, still many are so focused on efficiency and scale, you know, and growth, and uh, everything is about getting the cost down. You know, even when I go to agile transformations, we're like, how can we reduce cost? You know, so so this this mindset of the industrial era is so predominant. Um, you know, 
the reason I, I put this slide together is I wanted to really, you know, create a metaphor that says, well, what was the overarching organizing principle in the industrial era for getting work done? Yeah, and I and and, and that actually brought to mind that, <clears throat> get, like, when we remember when we go back to the industrial era, it was uneducated. Uh, you know, cheap hand labor that would ultimately optimize those those revenue numbers that we're talking about. But it was for, for a certain amount of people at the top, realistically. Um, work was commoditized. You know, it's, it's like I can go out and I can get 50 workers just by waving a flag. It's like, hey, we got some work and people will rush it. Um, and and it was it was a sluggish market. So it was there was not a lot of competition. It was basically, hey, Ford, you can buy Ford. As you said it very clearly in the slide, it's black. That's any car you want as long as it's black. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, Nico, like the uh, but but that doesn't really reflect uh, what what people and consumers actually. It's interesting because this whole paradigm created uh, this idea that that actually suppressed um, individual thought and it also suppressed uh, individual okay. opinions because okay. those were sources of variation. Right. And, and sources of variation in manufacturing are are. You know, any of us who have worked in, in any kind of, you know, physical manufacturing work understand that variation is the enemy of productivity. And so if you have a whole bunch of variation, you're obviously going to be uh, slower at producing this individual predictable thing. But that's, of course, if you're producing this individual predictable thing, which as you know, we transition more and more and more towards a service based economy, I should say have transitioned. Uh, the thing we're producing is no longer this physical good necessarily, or at least that's not uh, where a lot of the work and a lot of the challenge really is. And it's right. and applying this manufacturing type mindset of repetitiveness uh, into work that it's not really well suited to build on. Um, and, yeah, and, and it doesn't adapt well. The challenge 100 years ago was to get as many goods out to as many people for as cheap as you possibly could. And the market was largely undifferentiated. They didn't have anything. So they're okay if what they had wasn't built to order. They're all okay with the same car. They're all okay with the same TV or the same radio or the same anything. And then how do, how do you solve for that? You basically treat people as machines. You think of your organization as a machine and each person's a cog in that machine. And then you have you know the operating instructions at the top. So it's kind of like smart, educated people are treating the dumb people and the workers as basically cogs. You know, And the metaphor is, is, is person as machine. But then as we get into, you know, the modern era, it's the other way around. We're starting to think of machines more as people. They have behavior. So the, the, it's the inverse kind of metaphor, basically. And, and I think something fascinating with what you said is that it's, it almost kind of ties in as well in terms of knowledge. Like back in the industrial age, it was almost like you are just a cog in a machine. Therefore, you just do that. I am the knowledge worker. I am the one who tells you what to do because I'm the manager or I am the, like, the top of the pyramid. In today's world, it's actually almost the opposite, where the higher you get into a hierarchy, the less you actually know about the, the work. And it is those people that are close to the code, the digital goods, the specific product where we're delivering that, that, that are the knowledge workers. So it's, it's, it's almost flipping the paradigm altogether. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting you bring that up. I, this reminds me of a conversation, uh, or, or actually it was a presentation. I think uh, David Marquette gave it uh, last year or the year before at one of the conferences that uh, that we all attended and, and something he said kind of, yeah it really it really stuck with me um was he was like you know from this manufacturing era and, and the management system that was built out of it it was this concept of you know you've got you've got two classes of people essentially you've yeah. got you've got the thinkers and you've got the doers mm -hmm. and that fundamentally I think he called it, you've as, got the smart people at the front of the room and the dumb people at the back of the room <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly right and it was like it, it these were these were treated as almost separate species in this in this paradigm, right? And it's because the the doers uh, you could maximize your results if the doers could only just follow what the thinkers were saying and could only just do it exactly as the thinkers wanted you to do it. Now, the interesting thing and why that's so uh, dysfunctional and doesn't really work that well uh, when you start to increase the variability is the reason you talked about Nico, which is. Yeah which is the people who are traditionally in that thinking position, or at least from our perception or in this, this thinking position, actually are the least equipped with information that is current, uh, that is accurate, and that is you know, fit for what they're trying to achieve. They're so devoid of like market feedback because it has to filter through so many layers. It's very hard for them to make decisions. Like we're actually, they're actually putting themselves at a disadvantage to be centralizing all of that kind of decision-making, right? Because they just don't have the information to do it. 
hundred percent. And and it's interesting that we're getting down this topic is like I know we're we're going to talk much more in depth uh, in a little bit, but it's it's just like you can start seeing the dysfunctional um, impacts of the actual organizational structures that came from this era, just like the hierarchical perspective of just having that top bottom like top bottom approach with many different layers. Um, like literally drives exactly what you were talking about. Yeah, and I mean this isn't this isn't unique to uh, to anything like manufacturing. By the way, you you see this all over the world. You see this in author authoritarian governments. I think Jeff, you and I were talking about this yeah. uh, in a phone call the other day. Um, this exact same dilemma that that you know uh, CEOs and 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 high level managers of large enterprises that are that are very separated from market contact. Uh, these are the same things that cause, you know, longer term authoritarian leaders to lose touch with what works to keep themselves in power. And yep. uh, the interesting thing is over time, the longer, uh, a, you know, a dictator or an authoritarian figure stays in power, the more ridiculous they seem to most people. Um, now, the interesting thing is that if you were to sit them down and ask them, you know, do you think that your behavior is inappropriate or do you think that your behavior um, is getting you the results you want? Even if it isn't, they often don't know. Uh, and that's because they're surrounded with a group of people who aren't necessarily, you know, there's layers of translation in the information. They're not getting the real truth of and the real feedback of what's actually happening within their market, so to speak, right? And so the longer they stay in this separated position from the market, the less true the information tends to be. And so from their perspective, they are making appropriate decisions. It seems like that was the best course of action. Let's hit the next slide because I think we're getting right into the meat, which is awesome. Love it. So I think we talked about this, and so we'll probably breeze through this pretty quickly. But uh, uh, sorry, one slide back, Nico. Um, like today's obviously very different than, uh, you know, 100 years ago. Um, uh, you know, if you think about um, our users, we no longer have one undifferentiated mass of customers who will just take anything from us. Um, we've got people that want their own experiences. They want it personalized. They want it quickly. There's lots of competition. If they don't get the right thing from you, they'll get it from somebody else. Um, uh, you'll you'll notice that you know even if you know even if it wasn't just about you know highly differentiated users, technology comes along and shows the art of the possible. So people are constantly getting onto the next big thing, whether it's machine learning or it's virtual reality or Internet of Things, like the way we're providing. Even manufacturing is, is becoming service oriented. Most car companies are software companies more than car companies. Um, uh, and the most interesting thing I find about today is, is the workforce. It's educated. We now, we now have smart people that can think for themselves, which unleashes a whole lot of opportunities, but also creates a whole lot of challenges, especially if you're trying to, like we talked about before, if we have organizations that are using management technology that's over 100 years old, and that paradigm is treat people like automatons. And then you've got a whole lot of smart, educated people and the world is changing. That creates a lot of uncomfortableness for the people in that organization because they just can't stand the environment that they're working in because all this, all this stuff is happening that's dysfunctional that they could fix, but they can't do it. Yeah, or, or they're, yeah, they just feel completely, and I mean, you know, many people who've worked in large organizations probably felt this at some point, you, you can see an obvious need to change something in front of you, if only you had the power to change it, if only you had right. the, the permission, the fact that you even think you need the permission uh, is actually stifling uh, to, to a thinking being, right? I mean, a thinking person, if you have to say, oh, you know, I could do this, but I have to go ask three layers of permission, by the time you actually get to go put that idea into practice. To be honest, it's probably not that effective anymore because something has changed. And again, this is getting back to that same idea. If change is consistently accelerating, which I think we can all agree is probably happening, um, then the, the, the time, the, the delay between when an idea is good and relevant and when it's not, that time is getting shorter and shorter. Yeah, and so the absolutely. more permission you actually need to go do something, uh, it, it, it actually stifles the, the relevance of the idea completely and makes it more and more irrelevant over time. I mean, I mean, it's distance, but it's also context. It's both, right? So, yeah. so the distance, like the time it takes is really important. But uh, what, what I've been noticing, um, people in executive positions more and more are complaining that they don't know what's going on. They don't have a, like they're not keeping on top of all of the complexity. So they're constantly playing whack-a-mole. Oh, there's a fire here. Put that one out. Then they jump to the next fire and the next fire. And um, that's unfortunate for two things. First of all, 
if all you're seeing is fires, then you're never going to trust your organization to actually make decisions for themselves because you're you're like the cop who's always seeing people at their worst, you know, never at their best. And then the second reason it's unfortunate is when you're playing whack-a-mole, you don't have the time to understand really what's going on if you have any diversity in your business. So you're not taking advantage of the people that have the most information because you're the one making the decision. And it'll never have as much information as the people kind of like on the ground. I mean, I've never been, I've always gone to these big organizational changes and I've never had to, to say, here's what the change is. I've always been able to listen to the people on the ground. I mean, yeah, there's a few disgruntled complainers and there's some noise there, but there's a lot of signal when you talk to people who are doing the work. They know what's wrong. They know what's not, what's not working. And I typically, those people know way better than the people who are in the positional leadership positions, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like I, the, 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 the comment you made about firefighting really resonates because uh, I like to think of it as like, there's, there's two modes you can be in. There's, there's, a, there's a proactive mode, which is, which is preferable. Uh, or there's, you know, the mode we're probably more familiar with in business when change is afoot. Uh, and that's the reactive mode. Uh, the problem with the reactive mode is, is, you know, just like as a human being, think of it this way. Uh, if you're walking down the street and, and somebody's walking towards you, you can you can see them coming. You make a proactive decision to navigate around them. That's easy to do, right? Uh, you can you can go and you can move around that obstacle. But I mean, if there's ten obstacles flying at you and you're already on your heels, I mean, it's kind of hard to to make a good decision uh, and to and to and to think through what the what the outcome is going to be. So I mean, if you're if you're in a reactive mode, you're automatically at a disadvantage. And and so if you're operating constantly in this reactive mode, you're definitely not going to be making the best decisions at all. And likely for leaders like this, the only possible way to get into a proactive mode is to start reducing the number of decisions that you have to make. Uh, why do you have to make all of these decisions? Why do you feel that? That's probably because you've been living in a reactive type of mode for a very long time and it feels like it's getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, I, I think it's like this vicious cycle of complexity creates problems, create distrust, which creates command and control which creates more problems and it just kind of keeps going and going and going. It never gets better, you know, unless you, mm -hmm. unless the people in position of leadership start, start taking a different view, which we're going to get into uh, uh, a bit later. So, so I love this slide. I, I, um, uh, I borrowed it from uh, organizing for complexity, Neil Flagland's book on, you know, different ways of organizing for the modern world. And, and I think what resonated me the most about this is the idea that humans used to be the solution way back when, you know, I need a shoe. I go to a cobbler, he goes and gets me a pair of shoes. You know, it had to be a human. What kind of shoe would you like? What color do you want to be? I'll make it fit for purpose for you. And that meant very few people could afford shoes because it was super expensive to, to go and, and create shoes. You need a lot of people to, to, to kind of put shoes on everybody. Then the industrial age came along and um, the machines took over. And it was either actual machines or people acting like machines. And so that was the solution, uh, you know, is kind of like, you know, static instructions and very, you know, proceduralized work. And then we're, you know, like I said, not so new since the 70s, you know, once computerization, digitization, whatever, you know, lingo you want to attach to it started to become more and more prevalent. Markets started to become more dynamic. Of course, you know, it's not just about computers. It's also the fact that we've got globalization. We've got way more competition. People, you know, it's a problem of wealth, actually, if you think about it. It's also a, it's a problem of overabundance as well. Like when you've got too much abundance, you start realizing how much you're wasting in the current approach. And you start realizing how much value is being left on the table. Um, and, and so, you know, we have to complete, like we're still using machines, but the machines are now in service of people. Because machines now have software. They can now be configured. They can now be orchestrated. You've got robots. You start needing skill again. You start needing people to make decisions. And you want them to start making it quickly. So we're now relying on humans again. So it's kind of like full circle. Yeah, I, I completely I actually love this slide because it, it kind of ties back to those singularities that we were talking about. It's like you talked very clearly about the industrial age, you know. But now moving forward, there's all these things that are starting to actually come into play. Like, for instance, to me is that the, the, like you talk about abundance and it's that concept of digitization, which is that now a good becomes digitized which makes it abundant, which is that it's almost this concept that something that was fixed and limited all of a sudden becomes unlimited, it's bytes. Like photography is a great example, information, data, things like this. So now the way that you organize yourself around it is completely different. 
And there's all these different things that are trending us to change uh, dramatically. So it's like, I think what 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 drives my my my, my very strong interest is what are those things that are going to continue to push us forward? Are, what are those things that given we have the internet, we have now digitization, we're starting to get in the world, the exponential AI, all these things. Now we had this world pandemic completely yeah. change the way that we were, that, that we work, uh, that we think about work. You know, what is it like, how, like, what are those different dimensions that are driving us to the point that we are going to have that next change, that big change? Like what is that is coming and why is it that organizations are still thinking that top down, you know, pyramid based structures are the way to organize rather than start thinking it is today because <laughs> the world changes that I need to start thinking about different ways that are more efficient. So, you know, I mean, we've talked about this a bit, but what's interesting is uh, if you think of your, your organization as a, as a ship or a boat of some kind, I would say that most organizations are like cruise ships or they're like freight liners, right? They're, they're really good for, you know, creating a whole lot of output. Like they can move a whole lot of people at a very low cost, but they do it by going in a straight line from point A to point B. And, you know, that's great if you're trying to, you know, create a whole lot of value for a whole lot of people in a very well-known market and you know exactly where you're starting and exactly where you're going so you know cruise liners and freight you know freight uh freight ships are awesome but if you end up navigating in rocks uh not so good you kind of probably want a different class of vehicles like a whole lot of small little speed boats or you know you know rafts or you know whatever it is but it's, it's it becomes less about you know efficiently moving people at a slow pace over time and more about speed and maneuverability i like this metaphor because it's kind of like when you think of agile teams you basically say take this big freight liner and break it up into a whole lot of speed boats and if people think agile is cheap i'm like well it's not cheap if you're going across the ocean you can't do it with a whole lot of speed boats that'd be a really expensive way to get people across the ocean but you know, it's certainly a great way to navigate through rocks and rivers and unknown terrain and all this other kind of great stuff. So, this, so agile to me isn't cheaper; it's more expensive because you got all this feedback, all these teams are always stopping and learning. But you, you know, if you want agility, you've got to completely rethink the organization uh, from this big freight cruise liner with one captain to a whole lot of little boats where people are kind of maneuvering on their own. Yeah, exactly. I. I think you you said it better than I could have ever thought of, to be honest. Like the, the one thing that comes to mind is like even the Titanic sank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 It's, it's the the only question I have at the end of this, like it's an open question to people, is is you know think about in your organization, uh, why is your organization so slow to change direction? If it's large, it's understandable. It's probably common, but think about the structural reasons why movement in a different direction is so slow you might start to be surprised at the reasons why, and it often has to do with centralization. Yeah, absolutely. So here, yeah, hooray. Like this is apropos. Yeah, like the agile revolution, you know, if we just hit on the next slide, um, like, um, and you might as well just go through the, the, just hit forward once. Yeah, like, you know, this, this is kind of like, I deliberately sort of like dumbed it down to, you know, the core, definition of agile. I'm not including things like lean or design thinking or lean startup. Like I'm just saying, guys, if you looked at the original manifesto, you know, I'm not quoting anything verbatim, but it's it's about cross-functional self-organizing teams. They say people over process. I think it's teams over process. Um, uh, it's really about getting things out the door frequently so you get some feedback, you know. Um, so it's all about small, you know, minimum viable products, you know, constantly having those teams improve, whether they're doing, um, you know, really disciplined, continuous improvement or more lightweight, inspect, adapt, change type stuff. Um, you know, I don't think you can really talk seriously about agile if you don't have some component of the technical practices. I see a lot of, you know, kind of sticky note agile. We've been, we've been, you know, we've been um, guilty of, you know, um, helping adopt sticky note agile just because they weren't the, the, the client wasn't ready for the engineering pieces but I, I think serious agile conversation has things like test driven development and continuous integration and you know um you know you know all, all that kind of good automation and devops and all that kind of good stuff um and you know a lot of people kind of get religious about product owners uh, i'm not that religious about it but you do need the business embedded in what you're building you know um 
And so to me, that's kind of like, yeah, it's a mindset that says go and, you know, move your organization towards these things, basically. So I don't know. What, that's my definition of agile. I'm sure a lot of people will take, you know, or some people will take offense to it, but I don't know what you guys think, you know? Yeah, if I can add yeah, to that, I mean, like, like, like to me, it's interesting because like we've all heard about all the different agile tools, methodologies, do this, do that. And, and it ends up being like, hey, we took, I don't know, whatever methodology we started it and it, it's not really cheaper or it's not really easier. It's creating different problems. And we forget that it's it, it goes back to mindsets and it goes back to those principles, ways of how do we treat people just as humans and how do we relate in a way that we can communicate effectively um, and and focus in what is our output. And I know that it's very grandiose, but if you take a step back and you think about that, that kind of brings us back to things like, I need to work with business to understand what it is that I need to actually deliver. I need to have my client close so that I know that that's what they want. I need to have technology close so that I can be effective of putting whatever I created into the market and test it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's breaking yeah. the mold of the organization so that I can effectively integrate those types of principles and mindsets into it how you do it, it's completely based on the context of each one of the organizations. Well, I love the way uh, Kent Beck, when he started, maybe it was, it was Ward Cunningham, when they started extreme programming, they basically said extreme programming isn't extreme. It's all basic common sense practices, yes. but it's extreme in that you do all of them all the time. <laughs> you actually do them. <laughs> it could be renamed extreme common sense or you know extreme good sense because common sense isn't that common sometimes. So. Yeah, and I think like the, the, mainly, I guess the only thing I'd, I'd probably say, and this is maybe repetitive for everybody who who thinks this way, but 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 agile is not a process, right? And and yeah. and a lot of the follies of of uh, you can use it to to create a great process that's good for you in your context, um, and and that is fit for purpose at a time. But but if you just go and try to copy paste that, which is what a lot of folks, it's tempting, right? I mean, manufacturing era, copy paste. How many people are using the Spotify model? <laughs> it, it, yeah, exactly, right? And it, it doesn't necessarily work for them. I mean, you know, like the, the classic uh, quote I hear from something like a Spotify uh, implementation is, is, is people often miss this quote. It's that, you know, if you're gonna go and apply for a job at Spotify and you ask a question, like, who am I gonna report to? They're like, this is probably not the place for you to work. Now, most people won't even understand how that could be possible. And, and so do you really think that copy pasting that model into your organization is gonna yield good results? Yeah, probably not. And, right. and, and because the context is entirely different. So again, this is probably not that surprising for a lot of us who are change agents and who've been doing this for a bit, but uh, to others, it might still be pretty, pretty uh, counterintuitive is, is, is maybe what I would say. Yeah, and we'll get into some of the uh, the limitations of agile. Um, there's a it's pretty popular to bash agile these days, you know, especially if you're in you know a large tech organization like Amazon, or if you're in like you know a, a scale up slash startup, you know, it's almost something you can snub your nose at. And I actually think um, uh, I both I both understand it and think it's wrongheaded at the same time. Um, it's wrongheaded because I've. I've uh, seen how some of these organizations work to deliver like value and they are disorganized as all F like they are not well organized. You know, they take, they have long lead times, even Amazon, which is supposed to be, you know, the champion of the self-organizing team. They use, they use a lot of social pre peer pressure. They have yeah. a lot of implicit power, power structures, great results. Don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of toxicity in those organizations that could be improved upon if they just paid attention to some of this stuff. And there's now over a decade uh, of, of, you know, agile transformations and people using agile and those organizations are better at delivery software. They are, their teams are more responsive. The morale has gone up. The quality's better. The partners are happy. Now, if you look in it, you still might say, God, this place is not great. And by this place, I mean many of these big enterprises, but you should have seen them 10 years ago. Right, like there's been some massive improvements from Agile. The problem is, is people are painting it as this big panacea that can just solve all your world's problems. And you get a lot of, I just I'll call it flaccid Agile. You know, a lot of a lot of like vanilla Agile. Um, so yeah, I, let me hit the next slide. You can kind of see it. Um, you know, you have a lot of um, you know Agile kind of imposed into a hierarchy. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, hey, we put Agile on team A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, however, we still have a functional department. We still have a marketing department. All And they, by the way, they also are not just, you know, capability groups. They're there telling everyone what to do. Um, you have a whole lot of dependencies across all the teams. Um, well, there's a million reasons. Like, like how many times uh, have you been in an Agile transformation 
where the CEO or the CIO said, I want agile because it'll be faster, better, and cheaper. Oh, God. It's usually Everyone. the sales pitch in the beginning, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's how you start the conversation is, is like, let's be frank. You can get some good, tangible, early wins out of doing some stuff, but but it's going to have a very limited life cycle. Like once you make, once you go and exploit that, uh, yeah. what it's going to do is reveal the really bigger, the bigger, more complicated problems that that those things were born out of, and that's what you're probably going to see. We used to put better, faster, and cheaper on our decks when I was working for a much larger consultancy. Like that would be like agile will help you get better, faster, cheaper, and I would cringe whenever I put it down, but. It was the only way we knew how to sell it. And, and now I just refuse to do that. I'm like, if you want better, faster, cheaper, um, don't hire me because you need to think about better. Um, you need to think about more, instead of better, it's more humane, more inclusive, more aware. Then you'll get to better, faster, and cheaper. But better, faster, and cheaper is your, is your leading motivator. Uh, you know, you're just going to keep doing it the same way you always did. Even if the mechanics are different, the mindset will be the same. It'll, it'll never get better. So, so I think you talked about this, Sean. You know, it's kind of, um, yeah. you know, Agile works. I, I heard this actually, I was at a, um, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a movement out there called Beta which is very big in Europe. And they really talk about, again, it's it's Neil Flaglin and um, uh, a whole bunch of other people who are just as, as important contributors, but less famous, so I can't remember all their names. Um, Silkerman is another one. Um, and they talk about it from an organizational perspective and a leadership perspective first. And their idea of an organization is a value network. And the, and the idea is, is that you start from uh, you know, a structural, perspective and a mindset perspective. And the structural perspective is decentralized, which is not the same as delegating. Delegating, you can always take the authority back. When you decentralize, you permanently give the authority to somebody else. You decentralize um, authority into the people that are closest to the market. And, uh, and then if those people don't have enough permission to or, or capability to do things that they want, you add more capability. Uh, to those teams or to those areas of the organization that are closest to the market. You can still have a hierarchy. No one's saying you're not going to have, you know, VPs and directors and senior managers, but they become less uh, about authority and way more about creating mastery and capability. So they're feeding the teams. And if the teams aren't functioning well, they, they intervene by improving the system of work or by um, uh, improving the capability. So, you know, that, that to me is pretty powerful. And if you do that, then you can go apply agile methods. Yeah. Right. But the other way around doesn't work. You can't go and apply agile methods and hope you get to a decentralized, autonomous, self-organizing institution. And, and, you know, something that comes to mind immediately is interesting. You mentioned that because like even the, the way that we organize ourselves is that what is our core, um, like, like purpose in a sense, I know we're going to talk about purpose, but like as a team, what, what is what is the value that we're trying to create and can we align to it? And given that the organization may be still set up in a way that I still have reporting mechanisms, how do we align ourselves so that that is the same driver for all of us? Because it, it just reminded me of, you know, working with different clients where even within a team, you had different motivators and you had QA yeah. that were driving towards one thing, but the product went to another and the developers to another. And you know what? The product was terrible because of the way the organization was set up. So is that it's not coming in and say, no, you're all wrong. You need to completely restructure. It's just how do I align, how do we align our actual value drivers so that we can enable that type of decentralized thinking? Right. You know, and I find that that we often end up in in uh, debate as to whether, you know, you can truly do something uh, big, complex, meaningful, without the control of a hierarchy. Like if that's a conversation I've probably had many times. And and yeah. there's one example I love to point to, and and it usually stops the conversation or at least makes people pause for thought. And that's like, who builds a better operating system? Is it the open source community, or is right. it big, large enterprise? Just answer that question, and you'll immediately see that one of the probably most uh, well adopted, secure. Yeah. Uh, battle-tested operating systems, it's Linux, right? And and it What's continues- What's powering the web? Exactly, right? And so it's like, do you need another example? That's that's a pretty good example of decentralized autonomous teams. And they have some controls in place, like, you know, Linus Torval and the rest of the, 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 the contributors, slash, sorry, the committers do look at the code to make sure that it's in place. But whenever they exert command and control, 
they do it so that they can delegate right so they'll go and put a process in place that says only um committers can commit the code but then they put a process in place where any contributor can become a committer and here's how so it's Trust immediately me, right? it's it's immediately it's 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 structure but it's structure that creates delegation and you can do that in organizations it's not about just creating anarchy right away you can say these teams are are you know delegated to do this on their own and they can do these other things with some oversight however here's how you get to be into an oversight position by doing this behavior and it becomes a self-perpetuating system that increases the amount of decentralization over time uh, and that's the kind of technology that we can adopt from things like the open source world into our enterprises. But it has to start with the values, right, of the people at the top. Your, your job is not to go and give orders. Your job is to go and create these systems that can iteratively increase autonomy over time with safety. And that's the goal, you know. So it's funny. A lot of people will say, I agree. Jeff, Nico, Sean, that's awesome. I agree on the problem statement. Um, I also agree that... Agile as a, you know, as a movement and as a technology, a management technology um, hasn't, you know, necessarily had the impact on these problems that we want them to. So what do I do about it? Um, I actually think agile is still very much part of the answer. And by now I'm going to have a more expansive definition of agile. When I say agile, I'm including lean. I'm including design thinking. I'm including any, um, you know, DevOps, any approach that increases humanity in the organization through feedback, transparency, teamwork, um, uh, quality. Uh, but I think you can now use Agile, um, you can repurpose it based on what I'll call um, sort of a lot of modern management thinking is now going beyond uh, this idea of, you know, how do I order or organize for excellence and how do I organize around purpose? Um, so, so I've got kind of like this, you know, the, the, this principle in mind that says, you know, people that um, go to work that has intrinsically strong meaning um, uh, are more naturally inclined uh, to work with autonomy. They require less bureaucracy. Um, they're more, they're more, they're more likely to do the right thing. So, if if your agile transformation is not bringing the results you want, the first thing you can do is ask yourself. Is the purpose of my team, my department, even my organization, meaningful enough? And more importantly, are, is it authentic enough? Is it real? It's not just propaganda so that I can start moving towards autonomy and decentralization. You know, um, what's interesting about purpose is, you know, um, the need for corporations to have strong business meaning is actually on their on a CEO agenda. It's actually something that CEOs care about. You know, it's something that the world at large cares about. It's something that employees care about. There's all this data, which we can get into in our next topic. But I think one of the biggest things we can do to help supercharge organizations is work on meaning and purpose and do it so that it's authentic. and It's not just more corporate HR, you know, kind of bullshit propaganda. The second thing is it's great to say that we need to have strong meaning and purpose and organize around that. The other reason I've seen sort of agile transitions sort of not get the uh, momentum they should is there's just a lack of what I'll call precursors of choice. So there isn't enough trust in the system. Leaders don't trust, you know, people doing the work. People doing the work don't trust their leaders. Um, there's not a lot of safety. So people don't want to make experiments that are safe to fail. They don't want to iterate and try things. And, and they also, you know, people on the ground feel like they get overridden. So there isn't that sense of fairness. Now, there's a lot of research and a lot of case studies around organizations that focus on these kinds of preconditions. And, and uh, Burt's Org is an example, Handle Banking is an example, um, uh, PayPal is an example. N not just the classic, you know, Google, Amazon, they, th those aren't necessarily great examples, where they've actually focused on putting practices in place that increase fairness, trust, and safety. So one of the things we'll talk about as we go forward is how do we create those conditions so that we can kind of iterate across organization management and direction. And then the last principle is really around resiliency. So this is where Agile shines. Transparency, transparency, transparency. Feedback, feedback, feedback. You know, um, using those methods and those techniques so that everyone has the insight to understand how they need to adapt both what they're building, how they're building it, and who they're building it with over time. Awesome. And, you know, I think these are absolutely incredible, incredible principles that we can talk for hours on. But um, 
Um, this is a great segue for us to just leave it as an introduction to our next talk. Uh, but with that, I just want to bring it back to a close. Sean, Jeff, thanks for the great discussion. Um, we'll keep these going. I think this is a fantastic forum for us to just have a conversation over coffee. Um, but once again, thank you. And um, yeah, looking forward to chatting with you guys next. Loved, yeah. loved hearing your insight, guys. It was awesome. All right. All right, guys. Take care. Have a great day. Bye, guys.